All right. So we'll be starting. Um, thanks you all for being here. A warm welcome. Um, just before we start, I would like to um, tell you that if there is any questions uh, during the presentation, feel free to ask them. We would like to make it into an interactive um, session. So also take this opportunity to ask any questions that you have. I would like to introduce uh, myself first. Uh, my name is Wopke. Um, I'm working at the Climate Neutral Group. Um, and um, helping organization becoming uh, more sustainable is uh, a personal uh, drive for me. Um, I would like to introduce Tim as well. Um, he's working at the Antesis Group and already active in helping organization in uh, environmental consulting for over 25 years. And as I understood, five years from, uh, from Antesis. And he focuses on ESG, specifically on financial firms, where he helped them to deal with uh, any uh, issues on ESG. Um, I will be walking around uh, during the presentation with also a microphone, so if you have any questions, just raise your hand um, and I will be there. So uh, I'm sure that you can ask it. Thanks, Tim. Excellent, thank you. And hello, everyone. Um, don't know why they've given me the shift straight after lunch when you're all feeling sleepy. Um, <laughs> now, I'm conscious we had two brilliant speakers on the plenary sessions. Uh, today who've uh, used some choice swear words within their sessions. Back in the UK, I have a reputation for doing this, and everyone sort of sighs and rolls their eyes when I do it. They did it brilliantly this morning. This will be a scientific experiment. If, if it comes from a Dutchman, is it better than if it's <laughs> British? We will find out in the next <laughs> half an hour or so. Um, so I think I've escaped any of my fellow Anthesis colleagues coming up to listen. That's possibly because they're just bored of hearing me say similar things. Um, quick show of hands, is there anyone from private equity in the room? Or one-ish? Is that you, Luke? Oh, actually, so there is an Anthesian in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and he's one of our board members. And I've probably just <clears throat> dealt with the next bit of share issuing badly for myself. I ask on private equity because private equity is where I've spent a large portion of my consulting career working with PE houses. And in talking to this point of does ESG have the power to drive radical change, um, my key example will be just working through how private equity as one um, element of the financial service industry, how it's gone on a phenomenal journey driven by this thing called ESG. Uh, as Wupka politely mentioned, um, I've been in environmental consulting now for getting on for 27 years, um, which makes me, um, I've been working longer than the average age of most Anthesians, which is by itself upsetting, um, but means I'm a little bit closer to retirement, which is getting there. Um, and in that time, and so 27 years, 24 of that I'd be working for private equity. And during that time, if I trace it back, we find ourselves in a situation where it's only really in the last five years have I been working with private equity houses, really trying to drive action um, around ESG and drive action into their portfolio companies. For five years before that, they asked about and talked about this ESG but for all the years before that, it was around liability management and there wasn't action coming through. So that's going to be my primary um, sort of argument going through this. You start to wonder, is he actually going to get off slide number one? The answer is yes. But that's a lot of what I'm going to talk to as we go through this. So does ESG have the power to drive radical change? So um, Larry Fink. Uh, we focus on sustainability not because we're environmentalists, uh, but because we are capitalists and judiciaries to our clients. And I think what Larry Fink is probably the sort of key individual in the financial service industry pushing the narrative. There are lots of people doing more eloquent stuff, more thoughtful stuff, but he's the guy who's pushing the narrative in terms of making it clear that BlackRock's money, and there are loads of caveats to this, is going in a certain direction, and that is more and more to more sustainable activities as we move along. Um, but I'm just going to take this back a step 
and it's always important just to check everyone is on the same page and ask the question we'll talk to you know what is ESG um, because again uh, sort of five years ago um, ESG was a term that financial services firms talked to uh, but if you talk to boardrooms um, the C-suite weren't talking necessarily to ESG unless they were in certain um, certain situations. So when I joined Anthesis five years ago, um, Anthesis was a sustainability consulting firm. And most of our clients arrived because they wanted sustainability help. The two caveats or two differences to that were, uh, and the reason myself and a whole load of other guys from Environ were lifted in, um, which is what gave us our operations in a uh, bigger operation in Germany, in Italy, in Finland, um, was private equity was starting to talk to EST, um, ESG. And then also in the US, we had clients who were listed, who were being very heavily um, rated by Standard & Poor's, et cetera, and they were talking to ESG as a concept, but elsewhere it was sustainability. Five years on, and Thesis is in many respects an ESG consulting firm, and most of our clients are arriving, in my opinion, others might vary on this opinion, because there's an ESG driver, or that is how they are viewing it, that's the banner they're using. But ESG, so what is it? It's an umbrella term for 40 odd topics, and the schematic there um, points to them and sort of talks to lots of the different topics you've got in there. So there's climate change, um, there's talent and attraction, there's anti-bribery and corruption, etc., etc. But at its heart, what are we talking about? We're talking about how a business interacts with the environment, and more crucially now with climate change, how the environment interacts back with the business. We're talking about how a business looks after people, how it looks after its staff, its customers, and the communities in which it operates. And that community's bit you can cut in all sorts of different ways. The communities might be the community around a, a factory. It might be the community surrounding central London where our office is. It might be indigenous communities impacted by raw material um, extraction somewhere in the supply chain. That's the community bit. That's possibly the broadest and the most difficult to define sometimes. And lastly, you have governance. And there's two elements to governance. It's how ethical does that business operate? And then secondly, and crucially, how does it manage risk? The two are interrelated, but they are separate in a variety of different ways. So that's how we, well, how we see ESG or what falls in under ESG. Um, but how has it changed? I've started to allude to this, and you'll get the sense that I always talk about my slides way before I arrive at my slides. Um, how has it changed? So it's not just financial institutions uh, talking to this. Um, and it's not just tick box anymore. It's far from tick box. And the best example I always um, point to on this one is, um, so I do a lot of deal work. When a, a business transaction starts, an information memorandum or an IM comes out, which is basically the sales particulars for that company. Used to be that ESG or whatever the ESG topics were, were on page 156. And on 157 was the back cover of the IM. Now it's in the first few pages and there'll be a, dis a discussion around the ESG narrative of that business. Why is that business relevant in an environmentally and socially fair future, how will it make money out of that? So it's no longer tick, back, uh, tick box, it's important. It's no longer about non-financial reporting. And in this theme, all of these topics now are recognized to have an impact on value and performance. And you can cut the value in, in, in different forms, but it has an impact on value. Um, and, and to this point, as you can see, proved it again, so I've spoken to the next point before I've even got to it. Um, it's accepted as having implications for value creation. Um, but in some respects, it's also good to look at um, ESG as business's balance scorecard. 
in the last plenary session, we were talking about it's not just about profit, it's not just about turnover. There's a whole series of criteria which you can look at the health of a business in the same way as you could look at the health of society through sustainable development. This is the broader suite um, of issues will allow you to think about the business and how healthy it actually is. And crucially, um, and this is one of the key things, one of the things which have changed the situation in the last three years driven by COVID, ESG, because of the heavy risk management element to it, ESG has begun to be um, seen as a sure sign of a business's resilience. We talked about climate change and what would happen in a uncertain chain, uh, future where climate change was impacting supply chains, um, et cetera, et cetera. And people thought, yeah, okay, that might be in the future. It's not gonna happen. We don't need to prepare our business for this. COVID arrived. COVID demonstrated that supply chains can be completely and utterly hampered. It proved you might find yourself in a situation where you can't use your office. Now that might be because we were all sent home, but it might also be because flooding has impacted your office. So COVID proved the point that supply chains, that business can be fundamentally interrupted and showed those risks. So suddenly ESG was seen as valuable. And what you saw during COVID was a huge reallocation of funds uh, to businesses with higher ESG scores. Now that tends to be more in the listed space because those scores exist for listed companies, but we saw that taking place. Yeah, and um, to ensure that it's going to be an interactive session, we have some questions as well for you. Um, so I'm wondering um, who of you does recognize that ESG is at this moment um, a term which is really uh, talked about internally within your company? Um, just to have an understanding um, where you also are in, in the respect of, of ESG. Can somebody uh, can you raise your hand if you're working actively mm. on, on ESG? Well, crucially, just to um, prove my point, how many of you in your, op in your operations is ESG as a term used, mentioned? If not enough of you put your hands up, I'm just going to put this microphone down and walk off because I'm invalidated, but keep going. Okay, that's interesting. When we went back, if I went back to that slide, if we removed the term ESG or the banner for ESG, do most people recognise a lot of these topics as being issues that are important within their businesses? Okay, that's interesting. So you can always be very, very guilty of... Um, so, and thesis, we had a um, European management get-together um, last week in Frankfurt. And one of the big things that came out in our organisation is that the business can be, in some respects, too Anglo-centric. And that just proves, you know, I sit in the London market. In the London markets, ESG, and I sit in private equity, uh, where ESG is just the fundamental term. And I deal with corporates who've had a kick from an investor, which was two slides on, and are talking to ESG, but it just proves it, it's not necessarily always the language. Interesting. So let me move on. Um, but the stakes are changing this. So we're seeing um, there's been a huge rush of businesses reacting uh, to ESG um, and trying to change their operations to be more compliant or succeed in this space. And what we're also seeing at the same time is possibly the first sort of backlash going on of people starting to get more concerned around greenwashing and organisations making claims in the ESG space that they can't back up. And that's going to be both in terms of um, customers leaning back and questioning the claims and whether a customer is a consumer in the, in the street or it's a large purchaser in the corporate space, they're starting to ask more at, uh, questions on this. And then crucially, you're also starting to get investors questioning the credentials of businesses that they are investing in. And we're seeing the first signs of litigation taking place when uh, investors are turning around and particularly looking towards the fund managers rather than individual companies saying, 
we're not sure those claims uh, were, appro uh, were appropriate, were true, can be backed up. And so we're seeing this first turn on it, but overall, the momentum is continuing. Um, so in this space, we, um, and the sort of the basis of why I'm talking here is a lot of the work we do within Anthesis now is helping organizations develop their overall ESG stra uh, strategy and management arrangements. And what we're seeing in the market is whilst we're um, having certain of our more mature clients in the sustainability space slow up a little bit as they're impacted by energy pricing, et cetera, et cetera, a hell of a lot of new companies are arriving who are under pressure now to make their first steps arriving in and saying, we want to get our strategy in place. So a huge portion of our work at the moment is with new clients setting their initial strategy, starting to take this forward. We then help them um, work across actually delivering improvement on the ground, because the really big change now is, it used to be people set their strategy, it sat on a shelf. Uh, but if we follow through here, what you're seeing is that the reporting piece, the transparency piece is so strong now that people have to demonstrate improvement, otherwise they will be held up by their investors, their customers, et cetera, et cetera. And then also coming into this space, you start to have financial products arriving, ESG and sustainability linked loans, for example, where a company can actually achieve um, their borrowing at an advantageous rate in exchange for a certain level of ESG improvement within the organization. And we work on those as well from either a client or a lender's perspective, helping make sure that the criteria set for that improvement are actually legitimate, they are ambitious, et cetera, et cetera. So what is driving this at the moment? Now, um, I think there's five principal segments all working um, at different pace, at different level. Um, I'm going to start in the middle and move out. Um, so regulation. Um, what have we got? We've got two types of regulation at the moment. We have got governments pulling policy leaders to uh, policy levers even in order to try and drive change. So the example I always go to here is Western governments bringing forward the date at which petrol and diesel cars will no longer be um, sellable. That's driving the, e the hybrid, then the EV market, etc. It's driving the hybrid market. Um, you have those sort of levers, and then you have a second set of regulation, which whether it's aimed at financial services companies or whether it's aimed at um, mainstream corporates, is all around transparency. So the last speaker mentioned um, the CSRD, or the Corporate Social um, Sustainab Sustainability Reporting Directive, which will start to come in next year. And I think it's something in the order of 50,000 larger companies in the first instance in Europe will have to report. And crucially, it's reporting that is supposed to be linked and sit next to your financial results. And that's the big trend. We want transparency on how sustainable you are sitting next to your financial performance. So you've got that sort of legislation coming through as well, driving transparency, making it um, impossible for those companies who are behind to stay behind and free ride. Now, it's going to take a while for this to really kick in, but that regulation will just force action as companies realize that they start to be seen as a comparative laggard in the market versus others. This is partly being driven by investors saying, we want to reallocate money. The Green Deal in the EU has pushed the aim of moving a reallocation of finance to some more sustainable activities. And the regulation is now being put in place to make sure what is sustainable has criteria around it. You can't just make it up anymore. Um, there's gaps in all this regulation. Anyone who's looked at the um, EU taxonomy will find that they, well, other than the fact it's huge and you probably gave up reading it the moment you turned the first cover, um, it's complex. It has gaps in it, but the regulation is building now. What is sustainable will be defined 
and that's going to drive businesses. So if you want to seek that sort of investment in the future, you will have to meet a set of criteria. And that is driving a reallocation of cash and it's driving a reallocation of business models as businesses react to that. It won't be overnight, but we are seeing it in terms of a lot of our investor clients at the moment. In saying that, I sort of talked to the top left there, which is investors. Investors, you know, plenty of investors are just following the money because it's where the smart money's going. But plenty of investors are also um, reacting to the fact that there is a chain from the individual in the room who pays into their pension plan, who says, I no longer want any of my pension to go into oil and gas or into armaments, etc., etc." These are trends that are building up. It used to be just that certain big public pension funds made these decisions, but now more and more there are campaigns for individual firms uh, from individuals to m want to make these changes. And that then moves through to the LPs, limited partners, the pension funds, and they're changing their criteria and what they're going to lend to. So if you're a private equity house now, you will find that when you go out to the large pension funds and say, we're going to raise fund seven, um, they immediately turn around and say, OK, will fund seven be an article eight or article nine fund under the sustainable finance disclosure regulations? Because if it ain't, you ain't getting any money unless you are specifically aiming to, to not care about these topics. It's got to be eight, it's got to be nine. That's a huge proportion of what I do in my day job is helping funds now classify themselves and that will invest, that will then lead to what they're investing. So the money is starting to talk now and that is driving change. I'm probably way behind schedule, so I'm going to try and raise the cater. I've got a nod, I am way behind schedule. Um, the other areas, physical impacts. Now, we've just done a piece of work for um, British International Investment, which is the British government's uh, development agency. And it's just done a climate change survey of all of the businesses it works, it lends to in the developing world on what they're seeing in terms of climate change impacts. And the straight answer is they're all seeing impacts. They're seeing disruption to businesses, uh, to, to business activities. And that's, it's not just in the developing world. We've all seen across continental Europe, the UK, elsewhere, significant physical impacts from climate change taking, taking place. The UK just had its hottest temperatures ever. Um, loads of our infrastructure fell over. It's not hard in Britain for infrastructure to fall over, but it fell over more than it normally does. We're seeing that more and more. Companies are feeling it. It's the little things. It's the number of staff, how long they can spend out in the middle of the summer working if it's a physical job. It's bits of kit that sit out and are exposed to temperatures, extremely hot or cold or wet. Businesses are seeing these impacts and this is dry, starting to drive change. But all of this is within the ESG umbrella. You've got customers and you've got employees. Oh, employees is a quick one. It's more and more younger generations are saying we only want to work for those firms who are more positive on this. It's not in every industry, um, but particularly in professional services, particularly in um, highly academic industries, you see this movement. Um, and customers, customers is so broad. It's the man in the street spending his money. That can be a little bit more wavering, or it can be Tesco, the supermarket, putting massive requirements on its suppliers. Those are driving action, and it comes under the ESG banner now, and they want to see results. Not least, because if you are Tesco, a huge proportion of your ESG impact is in your supply chain. It's not yours. Sorry. Do you think the ESG will be the magic uh, key to change the process quickly enough? Because I have seriously doubts about that aspect. It's still a lot about reporting numbers, but not so much about transition. I mean, when you look at the big companies, they all report year <coughs> over yearly. You actually should make uh, real uh, decisions and programs for a period of about 10 mm. years. Uh, where they in, have to tell what they actually are going to achieve to challenge companies on that. 
besides that, I think we still need oil and gas. We uh, showed it uh, this year. So you have to even think about your transition in a way that it's been done safe. So you still need some, uh, need some money uh, going to the uh, traditional industries. Uh, so uh, a bit a, big, a bigger problem uh, around that is also necessary. So, but starting with my first question, do you think the ESGs really will make the change we need? Um, so my answer to that question will be the change we need will only be reached if public policy and public regulation is stronger to give some increased push. So I, I think without that, so just going back to my private equity example, last year we wrote um, together with the Science-Based Target Initiative, the Science-Based Target Guidance of Private Equity. That was a private equity-led initiative for them to get some formal guidance in place to s how to set a science-based target within their industry. Now, private equity has always been utterly resistant to this stuff, but this was 10 organisations, part of a bigger group of 100, who funded it, went off, got this stuff written. The first 10, the biggest being EQT, which is a top 10 firm, signing up to a science-based target. If you sign up to a science-based target as a private equity house, that means you are committing by, well, it's supposed to be by 2040, but most of them have gone for 2030, that all of your portfolio companies will have set a science-based target. This is massive change, absolutely massive. Will it get us everywhere? No. Um, I do think that to really drive this forward and, and the allocation of capital to this space is amazing and is making people rush to try and do stuff which within the bounds of the European regulation is more likely to actually be sustainable than it ever was. Probably gets us, I mean, I'm pulling this number out there, probably gets halfway there best. You, you will need stronger regulation and you will need, crucially, massive international agreement on this stuff because ultimately it's still a huge amount of free riding going on elsewhere. But at the individual level, if you come away from climate change, you know, there's radical changes in other areas of the E, the S, the G, which I think will be phenomenal within the space. But will it get us everywhere? No, is the straight answer. This is one part of the... Um, of the jigsaw. Yeah. One question on that. You mentioned free riders, so is the performance of free riders then better financially than of people who take ESG uh, series? Um, so that's a really, really, uh, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be company by company basis. Um, over time, at the moment, probably yes, in a whole variety of ways. It really comes down to the industry though. Um, over time, so it's the valuation piece which is really, really key. Now, I, I could, um, coming off environment, Deliveroo, do you have Deliveroo in the Netherlands? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it floated two years ago. They came to see us. We said, you're not ready to float. They said, la di da um, Didn't hire us, went ahead. They tanked shortly after flotation because they didn't have a whole series of, of elements correct. There will be increasingly over time companies that will, will do better when they come to their next liquidity event, when they have got a superior performance. But for the time being, there is going to be a chunk of free riding. This is a slow, this is a longer process. Yeah, it will be interesting to, to monitor it and to be able to... Uh, yeah, so that there are... A, a, so it's the repeat question we get when we're talking to clients is, so what are the proven multiples that people get for superior ESG? Uh, and on investment, they're typically sensitive for. Yeah, and, and, the, and the answer is you can't necessarily pull the numbers out at the moment. It's easy to pull the numbers on bottom line improvement because you enhanced your, um, your, your, you reduced your carbon footprint, you reduced your energy and within doing that, you've cut down your staff turnover, et cetera. You can prove those numbers quite easily. What that does in terms of value is always harder to pull out against the, the other numbers in the room. Did you have a? Yeah, it's more like a, an, an interest for me. So you've been talking a lot about Europe, a lot about the UK. Um, ESG is very apparent there, but how is it in the rest of the world, especially developing countries, especially countries like India and Africa, are they also like incorporating ESG because that's not their only challenge at the moment. They're still developing and looking for economics uh, and yeah. economic freedoms as well, as alongside ecological and social. So it, um, 
The answer is yes, but at, at a, a far lesser rate. Um, more so when the companies are um, international and they're supplied and they are part of a Western supply chain, yeah. then they are more likely to be pushed in this direction. I um, have to remember the European law is very, very shortly going to make uh, human rights due diligence mandatory for companies over a certain scale. And so that's going to put a hell of a lot more scrutiny on com uh, companies in the developing world. Um, in the wider sense, the US can be both brilliant and really laggard in this space, and the Far East is somewhere further back. But you see momentum all over, but you also see loads of, um, loads of areas where there's massive improvement met uh, still required. But is there like a kind of spillover effect from like, taking care of your supply chain companies? And oh, absolutely. It, it is. So this is... I'm a, I'm a Remainer. Um, so I voted to remain in the EU, as did 49% of us, unfortunately, not enough. Um, the European Union and the legislation, which might not be perfect, is pushing all of this to a level. It's, it's where the best practice is. And that push from, Western, uh, from European companies will be a real driver here. One really important thing about that legislation is, so if you take the SFDR, the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regs, um, if you are a British company, I love this because it will have really pissed off Boris Johnson. If you are a British f uh, company, that, uh, financial firm, that raises funds in Europe, actively raises funds in Europe, you are obligated by the SFDR. You can't get away from the regulations, unfortunately, Boris. Um, and similarly, and we're working for companies in the Middle East and a fund in China, one in India at the moment, if they are raising capital on Western, in European markets, they are obligated under it. So that's, you've got that level of push coming out. Now, yeah, I think you should uh, continue because otherwise we will not make it in time. Yeah, I've gone too slowly, haven't I? There's only about <laughs> another 30. There's only another 30 slides to go, kids, don't worry. Um, so, look, I've talked to some of these actually already to an extent. You know, how are we seeing change transpiring in individual companies? Um, and how is ESG driving change? So I'm going to race through these because in some respects we've already talked about them. So business is getting ready for IPO, being IPO ready. This was not something we helped clients with two years ago. Now it's front and centre for lots of firms, whether it's just preparing them for the extra criteria that will be uh, required of them when they are listed. Um, that's quite standard stuff and that's really quite easy. There's a big piece now around, A, making sure they've got no ESG skeletons in the closet. And then secondly, if we can pull out a positive ESG narrative, being mindful of greenwashing here, we only do it if we think it's real, um, that's, that's gold dust. So if you can talk, to about, talk about the fact that you're, um, and this is a real example, your um, company that um, helps repair washing machines um, if you can point out how it's a central part of the circular economy, that makes you an ESG play. There might be some bits in your business model you've got to deal with, but that's a valid element, and you can actually point to how you'd fit within the taxonomy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, ESG rankings and ratings. So they've always been there, but COVID made them more important. When COVID hit, lots of companies who were sitting with a lower level Standard & Poor's or MSCI rating suddenly got clobbered because they saw um, money moving away and moving to different places. So making sure your ESG rating is stronger, and that means improving across a whole load of areas. And it's not very clear, but that graphic going down the side, that's the standard and poor standard um, uh, info questionnaire. These are all the different topics you have to fill in. So to improve your score, you have to improve your performance. So that's driving change and quite significant change at time. Um, <clears throat> the SFDR we've, we've already discussed, it is forcing money into funds that are being set up for sustainable or ESG purpose. It's the reallocation of capital. Um, you can get easier, cheaper cash if you commit to do certain level of ESG improvement within your operations. And lastly, transparency, the CSRD, the regulations, are making sure um, that people can't hide the reality of what's happening in their operations. And more and more, 
investors will look into these and see the truth of the situation and it will force change because people will want to show a cadence of improvement over time. Um, I'll just skim this. So this is just talking to how we look at um, um, ESG performance within an organisation and ultimately we're going in a direction now of this double materiality and then sustainable performance which is the anthesis methodology which is slightly beyond that. Double materiality says there's a financial materiality and there's a sustainability materiality and you should look at them together in its simplest form. How do you, tell you, uh, how do you measure value destruction? There's a lot of companies who in their supply chain are actively destroying ecoservices. So how do you, I see those here? You don't at the mo moment, <clears throat> but that's where the task force for nature-related financial disclosures will come in in the long run, it's not really, I mean, in theory, a transparent company would be talking, a proactive transparent company would be talking to where it is creating harm and negative activity, and that should come out in its materiality assessment. Is there a quantification and value of that in most companies' accounts and reporting? Not, but that, that area is building up. That, that, that's the reporting piece that the regs go a certain level of the, re the regs will get you to put your carbon footprint in there. Will they tell you to force you to say exactly how many hectares of rainforest you've been involved with? No, but that will come out in the broader transparency. Again, it's all these things will come out and best practices driving it in that direction. I think that that transparency will really need to change. Yeah, it's, you know, transparency is the key here you c and, and consistent transparency where people are reporting on the same elements, but it's got to get stronger. And the task force on nature-related disclosures will be the bit which I think drives this forward in the same way as the climate change issues are being made more mandatory. And it, do, you, do you think fair pricing then is encompassed within this transparency? Is? Fair pricing? Um, not properly at the moment, but it will, again, the, the price... <laughs> Again, it's what, I think it's the next frontier for things to get properly pulled in. At the moment, it's relatively amateur. It's a little bit like um, actually pricing impact from a climate change perspective um, under the TCFD. At the moment, most people's reporting has got to the levels of the systems, et cetera, et cetera. Have they really priced in and disclosed the actual impact levels? No, but it's coming. And again, it's all stuff which would have been unheard of a few years back. How long do I actually have is the big question. Eight How many? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. <laughs> so let's, um, so what do we um, think a, um, a good business looks like in this space? Um, and I think this talks to the um, progression of businesses over time. So um, businesses mostly used to be reactive in this space. Um, where basically something came up, they reacted to it, whether it was regulation and instant, et cetera, et cetera. That's how they, how they worked. Most businesses are probably now more in the managed space where there is a certain level of um, advanced issue identification before it happens and a proactive approach to managing an impact combined with that reactive approach. That's probably where most businesses sit somewhere in that area. Increasingly, um, sustainability and ESG has to be integrated into the overall business strategy in order for success to really be possible and that value improvement piece to come through. And that's where we're starting to see more and more businesses thinking about this. In setting an ESG strategy, one of the things we say to them is, this can't be standalone. This has got to sit um, within your overall business strategy. And luckily, most of the firms we work with, the conversation we are having is with the CEO, or actually, going back to another comment from earlier, the CFO routinely. Um, and they are driving this through, and it is integrated because of that purpose piece rolling through. Um, I'm just going to finish off with... Um, a quick example um, of a business that we've worked with recently. Now, um, most of you probably have not come across Snowfox. 
Um, Snowfox are a Mayfair Capital Partners private equity um, uh, portfolio company. They are um, they do sushi for want of a better, uh, simplest term, and they run Yo Sushi, which is definitely the biggest brand in the UK. And then they also have a smaller footprint on the continent, and they're in the US and Canada and elsewhere. Now, they are a business that. Um, Mayfair will intend to probably IPO as the exit route in a period of time. So part of the work we've done with them is IPO preparation because IPO, the bar on ESG performance is higher than if it's going to be a trade sale. That's pretty much simply the case now. Um, and that's a reason for many firms to come to us now because they're just doing that IPO preparation. Um, but Snowfox is also a consumer brand um, and they are competing in a very busy market for higher end fast food. Um, and they are doing so whilst um, utilising raw materials, fish, um, that have sustainability issues um, heavily associated with them. So they are a business that realises to continue to keep their uh, consumer appeal in place. To hit that IPO requirements, they needed to get an ESG strategy in place. But the bit I really wanted to pick out here is, um, it's easy then to just actually focus in on those key areas, but a business needs to develop a narrative with its ESG performance as well. And that's really crucial. If you just tick the boxes, and, and one of the risks with, the, for instance, the TCFD, uh, not TCFD, the CSRD, and just reporting against its requirements is they're going to be quite bland. You can be able to see what their carbon footprint is. You can be able to see what waste they did. You can see X, Y, Z. Um, it means there is comparability, but it doesn't help sell your company. And so you do need to build a narrative out. And then crucially, if you are to improve, you actually have to have the people involved in your organization committed to achieving its goals. Um, boring ESG gets zero buy-in and goes nowhere. You do genuinely actually have to have buy-in from the staff to make it happen. And that's something we've learned over time. If you just hit what the regs ask for, no one, it becomes laborious, no one really enjoys being part of it. And so with, um, with Snowfox, a big proportion of the work was actually just talking to stakeholders within the business, finding out what is important to them. And that's asking the C-suite, and then it's also inserting questions um, in the staff survey. Now, if you don't do a staff survey, you're actually ticked down in most ESG re uh, ratings these days because that's a key part of staff engagement. But ask the questions within there, and you'll get a sense of what people feel is important. And this is circular, and that's come through in their strategy that as well as talking to the planet piece which is really really strong and how the products um, are connected into the environmental sustainability of the business the other key pillar and they've gone for three pillars and esg strategies always have pillars three to four key pillars that you're going to focus on and talk about in your narrative the people is the second one and they are a business that is um, particularly in the uk where a huge proportion of hospitality staff have left the UK or left the industry, they're competing for talent. So that people piece is central. And that's why they've got their three pillars here. So they've, they've been a great example of a firm that has um, gone through the process, identifying what is key to them, what is really material, setting some really quite significant targets in there, but making sure it's not just about the obvious, the E, it's about the people part as well. And at that point, I'm going to pause and hand over. Yeah, no, I just um, we have like a minute left, um, and, I, and, and I think you're at the end of your presentation. Yeah, yeah. yeah so thanks for that. I just wanted to see if there's somebody in the room that um, is encountering any challenges on ESG that they would like to ask a question um, to, to Tim now and um, to give an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so next one. I have a seat with our CFO and CEO, and I have to talk to them about the ESG strategy that I've made. Mm -hmm. um, we've been working, well, I've been working on it for quite a bit. 
it's not just mine, but in the past uh, there has been quite some uh, pushback. So I'm wondering if you have any tips for me to really uh, take the opportunity that I have and uh, yeah, go for it. Um, well, I'll give you the slide previously with all the different segments on it um, that points to this. I mean, I would, depends on the nature of the firm, but um, what normally, what we find more and more is when I talk to CEOs, they are conscious of, or CFOs, they are conscious of the next financing round, whether that's going to be a sale of the company, actual just physical refinancing of the company. They know that ESG will be part of the question set. And particularly if it is going to be a sale, these are going to be topics that come up and will be discussed. It's not always apparent, but it is a case. So first and foremost, I would be talking to that. We are uh, actually owned by a private equity, and it is definitely something on the agenda of our private equity who wants to sell us at some point. But I think the issue is that um, CFO, CEO, believe that it's really a tick box document kind of Thing, well, it's obviously not. So the other half of my time, so my real background is M&A, um, and that's what I've done for the bulk of my time. Um, if they sell to another private equity, the, the, and if this is sort of the, the rate, the due diligence has changed phenomenally. And two, three years ago, it would have been EHS, or Environmental Health and Safety Due Diligence, if there was a reason to do it, ESG due diligence would be done in-house, light touch. Now, if, you're, if they're selling to a bigger house, and I work for lots of mid-caps and lots of large-cap firms, we will arrive and we will do a full ESG uh, due diligence of it. And we will delve into every element of ESG performance, including um, an evaluation of the C-suite and whether they get it or not. Um, so I would, I would just be pointing to, it's always a bad consultant thing to point to the risks, um, but it, that, that piece, that, that uh, evaluation will be stronger this time round. But I would also just point to it's, it's about looking at the long term, forget environmental sustainability, but sustainability of the business and what it does. Is it, is it going to be moving into some significant headwinds whether it's around environmental issues, social issues. The, the, these are the large scale topics. If they ignore those, will the business still be sound in X number of years? And how will, if they get larger and the CSRD, et cetera, comes in, if full transparency is on the business, how will they stand up? And it's these sort of points I'd be, be looking at. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> and and let us know. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you have any more questions, Tim will be walking around uh, all day long, so feel free to, to reach out to him um, or afterwards after the event. Uh, I would like to thank you all for your time and being here in a bit of freezing room, I have to say. <laughs> but mm. uh, thank you all and a big applause for, uh, for Tim. Shucks. Thank you.